Okay. Yes. So, I mean, thank you. Let me start off by uh, thanking uh, the organizers and, and Wima in particular for um, the opportunity to contribute uh, at this very important uh, session. And the title speaks volume, talks about the, the Futures Forum on Preparedness, uh, uh, which is extremely uh, important. I think uh, the COVID-19 pandemic has uh, taught us at least from the perspective where I state three things. Uh, it has taught us how connected we are. It has taught us how vulnerable we are. When I say we, I mean the collective we. And it has taught, taught us the inequalities or expose the inequalities that exist at several levels uh, uh, in, in, in the world we live in. And I've always seen this, um, in the last one year now I've seen from my position, vantage position, where I sit, uh, four things that uh, guide an effective uh, uh, response. I think one is understanding the, 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 the population, and uh, that, that speaks volume. The population means uh, from where the way I would characterize it is uh, uh, the behavior of the population vis-a-vis -vis, uh, public health measures, and I'm happy that the previous speaker touched on uh, the, the, the public health and science. But I would like to uh, take that further with respect to the behavior of the population and the trust, the trust capital that is so important in communicating any public health message. The second thing is the pathogen, understanding uh, the pathogen. I think it is fair to say that our understanding of the COVID-19 virus has improved significantly since one year now. And uh, uh, it's amazing how much we've learned uh, about the virus. It's amazing how much we continue to learn from the virus, like the new mutants that are emerging from studies in, in the UK and, and from South Africa. The third thing, of course, is the policies that are important in driving this. None of the things that we do uh, at the regional level will matter without a very strong uh, policies around, around that. And then of course, lastly, is the politics. So, I mean, in some, the, the, the population, the pathogen, the policy, and the politics, each one of these played a significant role in the manner in which uh, we will manage uh, or at least contain the, the virus or a pandemic such as the one that uh, we have. Let, let me just dwell on, on two aspects here, which is the policy and the, the, the politics uh, part, part of, of, of that. So, first of all, the way if we have to prepare effectively for uh, future uh, uh, pandemics and outbreaks, we have to look ourselves inward and really try to understand uh, uh, from a very uh, humble standpoint with respect to the three things I started with, the vulnerabilities, the um, uh, 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 inequities that exist and uh, uh, also the, the connectivities. In 1971, uh, a paper was published in The Lancet by uh, Julia, uh, Julia uh, Trudeau, and it was entitled The, the, um, the Invest uh, 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 Health Care Law, where essentially the paper stated that uh, health capacity and capabilities tend to be in areas that uh, need them less and then uh, in areas that uh, we have a much burden of the disease and the need for that. I think that law still applies today, but it's amazing how much that law has been challenged um, today with this um, pandemic. If one were to bring uh, Julia uh, to do today with, with that paper published in 1971, I think that law will fall completely apart because uh, they have shown us that, that we are more vulnerable regardless of whether we live in the global north or we live in, in the global south. So going forward, how do we uh, uh, organize ourselves in terms of um, preparing for the future? I believe that we should really look at uh, the policy and politics piece of how we organize ourselves, first organizationally, at three levels. One level is really at what I call at the global uh, uh, policy and, and politics of, of pandemic preparedness. I mean, that is uh, the world of the WHOs and the, the UN systems that are very important. Recognizing that um, we have to not only strengthen organizations like the World Health Organization, but empower them. Empower them so that they have the capabilities, 
and capacity to do the work that um, they, we, 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 they have the mandate to do. The second level, which is extremely important and valuable to, um, uh, uh, to people like us in the regions, is the regional capacity and capabilities. If we have to prepare ourselves and learn lessons from this current pandemic, is that having a centralized organization uh, 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 that coordinates the whole uh, the, the health security of the whole world and preparedness for the next pandemic is not enough. We need to begin to regionalize and have regional bodies like the, what the Africa CDC is to the continent of Africa, the powerhouse of the world and, and other institutions around the world. If we strengthen and empower those organizations, then, then you feed into, uh, then they can connect easily with the global architecture that is, for example, the WHO-like uh, organizations there. But at a grassroots level, we have to be very deliberate and say that we have to and must have local capacity, national structures. Global health security starts with national health security. If we have weak national health security, we have weak regional health security, and we have weak global health security. So it is an illusion in my mind that we talk of global health security without a very specific focus on national health security. I think from that perspective, I would argue from the regional standpoint that there are three things that we must look at very carefully going forward. And the three things are both the ability for the regions to focus with respect to preparing for the next pandemic or outbreaks on, on diagnostics. How are local diagnostics produced? And how are vaccines produced originally and locally? And how are therapy, therapeutics produced locally and, and consumed locally and locally and regionally? I'll use that interchangeably. We are in the middle of a pandemic, and we know that the greatest geopolitical dimensions and discussions that are going on now are fair access to vaccines, to COVID vaccines in the world. And this is an, uh, an opportunity for truly global solidarity and cooperation. But we've also seen how much we've struggled as a world with respect to protecting ones in the country, protecting individual citizens of a, a country versus being more outward looking and seeing that a pandemic that affects anyone else in the world would affect all of us regardless of where we are. Again, in the spirit of being connected to the vulnerability that I spoke with. Uh, that. Uh, connecting with the ability to uh, actually uh, expose the inequalities that we uh, we have. When the COVID-19 pandemic hit the whole world, early on in the pandemic, the continent of Africa had very limited access to diagnostics. I think we were very, very concerned with that. We were frustrated with that. We wrote uh, multiple papers arguing for access to diagnostics uh, to uh, for the continent of Africa. Uh, we have since built relationships and partnerships that have changed that uh, dynamics. Now we are in the, the period of uh, vaccines. And again, the same cry, the same struggles, the same challenges and the same frictions and tensions are arising. Exactly the same uh, uh, futures that characterize access to, um, to, to diagnostics. Yes. I'm very sure that so when John, and if... Uh, yeah. So John, before you, before you continue, I wanted to... Um, uh, ex uh, explore a couple of points uh, with you. Um, uh, just to say that um, uh, thank you very much for that for that uh, quite broad overview. Um, and for those of uh, members of the audience who don't uh, know Dr. Uh, Kengasong, uh, he's a veteran uh, of the US CDC, uh, and he was yesterday with congratulations uh, named the African leader mag in the African Leadership Magazine as Africa's public health champion of the year uh, of 2020. So, um, and I wanted to just, before you go into the vaccine um, issue, um, just ask you the following question because you raised the importance of uh, a regional and national strength um, when it comes to uh, dealing with pandemics. Uh, to ask you, one of our recommendations in our report is to strengthen the regional collaborating centers. There are five, for those of you who know, don't know this architecture, five regional collaborating centers uh, at the Africa Center for Disease Control, which is based in Addis. Uh, and those regional collaborating centers are supposed to become public health institutes in their own right. So I wanted to just explore with you 
from your point of view, whether you think that uh, that is a good recommendation to make, which is to build surveillance investigation and rapid response um, um, capability uh, at those RCCs. Is that the right priority? Were we on the right track? What is your view on that? And then once, uh, once you answer that the, the question, I want to look a bit closer at vaccine procurement, um, as well as uh, Africa CDC's role in school closings. So back to you, John. Wilmot, if you don't mind, if you can, you, we're a bit broken. The, the, uh, we, the, the line dropped when you asked the question. My, my apologies. Yes. So the, the, the question was, um, is strengthening, could you tell us whether strengthening the regional collaborating center is the right priority uh, and strengthening them in terms of their public health capacity when it comes to surveillance, investigation, and rapid response? No, absolutely. I, I think that is where I was uh, coming from when I talked of the strengthening uh, the local uh, uh, capacity or national capacity. We need to look at, I uh, say, the continent of Africa as, as, uh, and, and divide that up into the five regions, but look at how, what the regional collaborating centers, and there are five of them uh, in Egypt, Nigeria, uh, uh, Zambia, uh, as well as, as, as uh, Kenya, can all work together to support national public health institutions in the spirit of strengthening regional and national health security. I think it is clear that the population of the continent has uh, uh, expanded significantly since independence, and it is very difficult to begin to think of ensuring the, the health security architecture of Africa by just having an Africa CDC base in Addis Ababa. We have to absolutely have uh, regional collaborating centers uh, strengthen, but very importantly, to, to take that uh, uh, strategy back to the uh, national uh, level so that national public health institutes can also be strengthened and then form a network in, in, in each of the regions. Okay, now thank you very much. Uh, so um, um, if we now can get back to the issue of vaccine, uh, of vaccines, because um, the recommendation clearly um, uh, has to be that there has to be upscaling of testing, and we've uh, we've heard all the the important uh, considerations for that from you and from others. Um, and then uh, what it is we do in terms of vaccine procurement, manufacturing, and delivery. So it seems. Are you there, John? Yes. I'm here. I'm here. Absolutely. I, I think the, the continent is uh, pursuing uh, three different avenues for for vaccine. First of all. Let me uh, just express a very strong support for the COVAX facility, which is a true expression of uh, and, and symbolism of, of, of uh, global cooperation and coordination. However, we also know that um, the, as a continent, we are, uh, the, we've been told that uh, the continent received about 20% of its vaccine doses there. So we are left with about 40% to get to our 60% uh, target. Uh, which is a target that we have set for ourselves as a continent to achieve a population-based uh, uh, immunity. So we are looking at also financing uh, 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 vaccines uh, through a mechanism called AVAC, which is the African Vaccine Acquisition Task Force that was set up by um, the chair of the African Union and with uh, different parties and players uh, helping in that effort there. So uh, the key thing, and then of course, the lastly is individual countries' effort working closely and the coordinated fashion with Africa CDC. So we are really, um, is, um, uh, the first quarter of 2021 20, uh, might be challenging, but we have remained optimistic that going forward uh, uh, vaccines uh, will, be, will be able to uh, carry out massive vaccines on a scale that has never been uh, seen on the continent of Africa. So we now uh, in the logic of uh, putting in preparedness uh, strategies, that will enable a rapid scale up of the vaccines once they become available on the continent. So we uh, thank you very much, John. So we always also see that there's limited production um, um, capacity, very limited in Egypt and in South Africa, um, and um, and in uh, and to some degree in Kenya as well. And so uh, there has to be an effort to scale that up uh, and turn it into. Uh, uh, facilities that are able to, in fact, contribute on the manufacturing side, although most of it would have to be procurement. So thank you very much. We received a, a question from Kuta Banda. She's a 
Lisa MPH graduate, who is a senior research coordinator at Zambia's uh, National Public Health Research Authority. Um, and she used to be um, at the Senior Research Associate, uh, as a sorry, Senior Research Associate at Zambia's Ministry of Health as well. She's online and she asked the following question, uh, if I can, um, uh, uh, she's online, so if she can put the question around um, uh, her first question that she has. Thank you. Um, I have two uh, uh, questions. The first one is, with more and more African countries uh, like Zambia reporting increased cases of COVID-19 and many people presenting with uh, severe effects and also having a lot of people who are dying from home, especially with the new variant of the virus, what is the Africa CDC doing to help strengthen our um, health systems to be able to especially prevent uh, some of these um, cases and people dying from home. And then the second question is, um, what can African countries do to ensure that um, the evidence that is being generated from research and um, all the other activities that is generated is shared promptly in ways other than uh, research publication um, so that uh, people have current knowledge that can be translated into action um, and also uh, promote um, a regional response. Thank you. Thank you very much. So John, we have, uh, we have three minutes left in the session. So uh, over to you. Yeah, that, that, that is, those, are, those two questions are great. I think, let me start with the last question. I mean, if you uh, are a chance to uh, dial in every Tuesday at 4 p.m. East African time, uh, we'll be, uh, you'll join a group of researchers across the continent. We just finished a session, a similar session uh, at 4 p.m. Uh, East African time today, where most researchers on the continent were together discussing the, 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 the situation of the new variant in South Africa. So that, um, I mean, so we provide that platform as Africa CDC for open discussion, sharing of experience and data and new developments. I think almost in real time without um, waiting to publish uh, data. I think that is um, again, an open invitation to join into that platform every um, uh, Tuesday at, at 4 p.m. East African time. With respect to what we're doing, we have been supporting member states from the beginning uh, to strengthen both their diagnostics, their infection prevention control, the case management. We've actually trained more than 11,000 uh, 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 caregivers across the continent and deployed over 10,000 community health care workers, including in Zambia, to support that out. In the second wave, we really have to um, look at our strategy and shift that, uh, what we, uh, 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 our strategy to meet that challenge, uh, that current challenge, which is really, supporting countries to have more oxygen okay supplies because you really want the, the ability to manage those cases there i mean appropriately because people are dying from just lack of oxygen in in the facilities i think those are things that we will be issuing new recommendation and guidelines and of course working with member states to to mobilize resources to support them in those areas so thank you very much for um for kuta Banda for questions for john for his answers uh, in closing, let me just thank uh, John uh, Kenga Song very much. Uh, he's extremely busy. Uh, we admire your energy, sir. Uh, we certainly admire your leadership on the African continent in terms of uh, pushing on the public health front in response to COVID-19. Um, we're very happy to collaborate uh, through our institutions with the Africa Center for Disease Control. Um, and so, and thanks, so thank you very much uh, for your time. Um, and uh, and good luck. Thank you. Thank you again for the opportunity to uh, be part of this important discussion.